My name is Marianne Apostolides, and I'm the author of Voluptuous Pleasure, The Truth About the Writing Life. Voluptuous Pleasure is a collection of nine stories, all of which um, question the notion of narrative truth. So the collection is nonfiction, um, and yet the entire enterprise is about uh, examining the notion of fictionality and truth in literature, as well as in the self, in identity and in history. Um, the title comes from Roland Barthes' book, Camera Lucida, in which he writes, it is the misfortune, but also perhaps the voluptuous pleasure of language not to be able to authenticate itself. The noem of language is perhaps this impotence, or to put it positively, language is by nature fictional. So I've written a book of nonfiction whose title states that nonfiction does not exist. The truth about the writing life, that's a, that was, um, that subtitle is a little cheeky in some ways because I, you know, it gets people to pick up the book thinking it's going to be 12 steps to become a real writer. Um, you know, number one, get up in the morning, do your morning pages, um, which is not what this book is about. Um, the truth about the writing life um, is that, is that the act of telling story is a vital, dangerous act. And the truth in all of these stories is that as writers, but also as human beings, we are hopefully constantly creating um, and recreating the narrative of ourselves, our history, the meaning of that history, our desire for the future, our presence. And so I, I guess that's what this book embodies, is sort of saying to people, there is an urgency to do this as people and as writers, um, and, and that's what the writing life is, is this attempt to create and recreate self in a meaningful way. I had been working on a book about my father's childhood during the war, his experience um, of growing up with bombings and starvation, the disappearance of his dad, the revelation that his father had been killed uh, after a, a year of not knowing. And I had interviewed my dad and gathered this material for a decade and was unable to create of it a cohesive narrative that portrayed physically and powerfully the truth of that experience. And um, subsequent to the failure of that manuscript, I very easily could have given up. And I didn't. <laughs> I took that material and I worked with it and attempted to make of it an object that could communicate and convey a physical truth. So three of the stories in Voluptuous Pleasure concern my father's childhood and this material from Greece. Each piece is quite different. Um, so I wouldn't say that there's a specific process that I used for every, uh, throughout the entire narrative. Some pieces, like there's one piece that is structured around uh, the early Socratic dialogue, Laches. So I'm working very closely with that text. Um, others uh, began with a situation, a moment, in my life 
that was potent, and I used language to attempt to understand why, uh, why it carried such power and how I could convey that in words. My ideal reader for this book, somebody who wants to sit deeply inside narrative and steep themselves in language. This is not a book that moves forward on the surface of plot. And it's not a book that explores uh, characters and their interrelationships and ends it there. It's sort of, um, there is plot, yes, and it is something that you can follow along and characters do have interactions and dialogues that you can grip onto and find humor in and see a development and a tension, yet all of those things um, the soil from which they arise is, is um, one of, of uh, the stuff of language itself and thought and meaning and self. The big questions that when we put straight forward like that sounds so silly and stupid. Um, but when we, when we ask with language and apology, <laughs> um, it's quite rich. So many people have attempted to define that genre, creative nonfiction, and their definitions are laughable. They're ridiculous. This point by point, it can do this, it can't do that. It, if you do this, you've crossed a line and it is no longer. And I find the definition so silly because that's not the way that we write. And if we do, we're not writing well. What is creative nonfiction? What is this work? This work is beginning from a place of actual experience and taking it into the, the uh, non-reality of language and narrative. Non-real in the sense that they ha are not actual physical historical events. Language is not a historical event. My grandfather being murdered is a historical event. So I have to somehow breach those two to provide for you, the reader, a physical experience. That to me is creative nonfiction, those three. Philosophy pervades voluptuous pleasure, although it pervades the book, Voluptuous Pleasure, as well as, I guess, the experience of it in our normal lives, I would say. Um, but it's not foregrounded in most of these pieces. Um, and so I hope that people won't be afraid of the book, thinking that it's going to be critical essays on philosophical topics. That's not my interest. I would have written a very different book if I were questioning um, what is reality from, uh, you know, philosophical tradition. Um, but I can't, I can't um, structure my narrative. I can't make it alive and sort of have that viscosity without being um, fed by philosophy. So that's what I drink and what I absorb in order to create something, uh, to create a story that is not, um, is not something you can sort of consume and forget about. <laughs> um, you have to struggle with the stories in some way or dance with them. 
And I can't do that unless I'm struggling or dancing with something that's bigger than me. And for me, that's philosophy. So the piece I'm going to read from is the beginning of What We Do for Money, which is a piece set in the brothels of Nevada, um, which I visited as a 21-year-old uh, undergraduate. And this piece arose as I was attempting to understand an incident that happened, a conversation um, with a particular prostitute, and I was attempting to understand what she was trying to tell me and what it was that I learned physically. What we do for money. George bought me a drink that afternoon. He jerked himself onto a stool, wiped the sweat from his forehead in jowls. This is Tammy, he said, introducing me to the bartender. Pleasure, Tammy offered, extending her hand. Tammy had worked as a prostitute for three years, George explained. She'd switched jobs the previous month when she was fitted with a mouthful of braces. Tammy smiled silver and poured two shots, sweet brown liquid that cracked the cubes of ice. It'll take me years to pay the orthodontist bill, she said, considering the tips I get here. George flung her a 20. Thanks, Georgie. She winked and smiled, slipping the bill in the back pocket of her jeans. The fabric parted for her fingers. George turned toward me, proposing a toast to college girls. I clinked his glass and pretended to drink, letting the liquid flow close to my lips. I didn't really consume alcohol at that point in my life. I didn't consume food either, not in public anyway. Lord love college girls, George said, exhaling the fumes of scotch. Amen. <clears throat> I wore stretch pants that day and a boxy cut blazer, a fashion choice based solely on the fact that those particular garments fit me on that particular day. I was a virgin, a bulimic virgin Princeton undergraduate writing about commercial sex from a purely legal perspective. Purely. College girls and scotch, oh lord, oh yes, a beautiful combination, don't you think? What do you think, Tammy? I think all girls are beautiful, George. Amen. Beyond the bar was a vast lobby ringed with couches on which various women lounged about. Some wore lingerie, others sat in jeans and button-down blouses. Many knitted or busied themselves with nail files and polish. She was reading trash. Romantic, tragic, a story swollen with bad writing, but I imagined it to be otherwise. She was beautiful. The lobby of the Mustang Ranch, this most illustrious brothel in the illustrious state of Nevada, was fed by a single narrow hallway. Here was where the men entered from the dusty parking lot as one was entering now. A buzzer blared to announce his arrival. The women rose from the couches and formed a line across the carpet. From my spot at the bar, I could see only their backs. Hers was strong, two columns of muscle rounding toward her spine. She leaned her weight on one leg, thumbs hooked in the waistband of her pants. They were blue pants, capri style. Her tank top was tight, striped in red and cream, cropped at the last rib. While she awaited the man's decision, she shook her hair out of its twist. The tips brushed against her skin, low down, were the back arches all of its own. The man took in the abundance of women aligned before him, all those limbs and torsos and breasts and lips. The Mustang's madam, older and elegant, spoke to the man with comforting guidance. He nodded looked to her face, then back to the lineup, his left knee bobbing. The madame laid one hand on his shoulder and swept the other through the air, displaying the options. The women didn't twitter or vamp. They stood. She stood. She gathered her hair straight and long and chestnut brown over one shoulder. She waited. 
I bet he comes to the bar first, George said. Lots of times they come to the bar first. They have a drink, relax, get to talking with the lady. They leave shitty tips, Tammy said. George retrieved his billfold. He dangled a 20 between two fingers, making Tammy come and get it, which she did. The man at the door pointed to a woman in a pink teddy covered by a faux silk robe, the belt undone. I was wrong, George said, observing. You don't know how to read them. That's not my job. The other girls resumed their positions on the couches. The woman with the tank top touched her forefinger to her tongue and turned the page of her book. I thought she might have looked briefly toward the bar, toward me, but I'm not sure. I didn't look back. The ice was melting in my drink. <laughs>